To the UK now, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is in Northern Ireland. He's hosting US President Biden in Belfast. It's a very short visit, not even a full day. Northern Ireland is a conflicted region. It saw 30 years of violence. Then a peace accord was signed some 25 years ago. It's called the Good Friday Agreement. Biden has come to mark the anniversary of this agreement and to hail its quote-unquote tremendous progress. But Northern Ireland remains conflicted. Brexit is unraveling the delicate peace. And Rishi Sunak has his plate full. When he comes back to London, he'll have to deal with another crisis. The rising cost of living is pushing people to the edge. They say costs are high and wages are low. Doctors say they're among the worst hit. And now they've gone on a strike. It's expected to cause unprecedented disruption. Here's a report. Three hundred and fifty thousand. That's how many appointments and operations are expected to get postponed in the UK. That's over a quarter of a million patients having their treatment put off to a later date. And this is happening because junior doctors across Britain are on strike. It began on Tuesday and will go on till Saturday. Tens of thousands of doctors are on strike. Just to give you an idea of how significant this is, junior doctors make up about half the medical workforce in the UK. They're not coming to work. Their demand is pretty simple. They want a 35% pay hike. 26% less. It's quite a lot to ask for, but these doctors argue that they have suffered a 26% pay cut over the past 15 years. The British government has called their demand unrealistic. It says such a pay hike would mean some junior doctors getting more than £20,000 in additional pay. And Britain can't afford that. So we are ready to have discussions with them, but clearly a demand for 35%, over £20,000 for some junior doctors is not fair or reasonable. Uh, and that is why we've not been able to make progress so far. But we want to engage constructively. We recognize that was the British Health Secretary. Remember, the strike coincides with the Easter school holidays, Ramzan and the Jewish festival of Passover. Also, this is the biggest industrial strike in the history of the British National Health Service. According to the Health Secretary, the strike poses a considerable risk to patient safety. But that's not where he stopped. He went on to accuse the doctors of maintaining a militant stance in negotiations. The doctors obviously have a different take on the matter. According to the British Medical Association, junior doctors earn just over £14 an hour. But the pressure on them is only increasing. Patient waiting lists and the workload is at record highs. Couple that with the cost of living crisis and double digit inflation. And doctors are failing to make ends meet. Many of them are victims of depression and mental distress. I mean, I'm only four years post graduation, but there's already been suicides from my graduating class. I've got friends who've left medicine because it's broken them. I had. I had to have counselling for PTSD symptoms after the, the COVID oh, pandemic thank you. because thank you. it was just, it was, it was a horror and we're still expected to carry on as though nothing's happened and deteriorating conditions and it's just, it's getting to the point where we're all at breaking point, not, not just financially but mentally and physically, we just can't go on like this. Our doctors are leaving to Australia, Canada, New Zealand, other industries where they feel they can provide better care and they can have their salary doubled. We're not asking for that. All we're asking for is to get back to net neutral, just back to 2008 levels where the service ran more efficiently, when the waiting list was a third of what it was today, and when doctors were being paid a slightly more appropriate wage. Strikes in the UK have now become a regular affair. Over the past couple of months, industrial strikes and picketing has hit nearly all sectors of the British economy. Nurses, teachers, university staff, train and bus drivers, civil servants, security guards, they have all taken part in strikes. Their demands are basically the same, better wages. Inflation is slowing, albeit at a snail's pace. So workers need immediate increments in pay to adjust to the new reality of life in the UK. One where they need more money to survive but the UK's economy is shrinking. In fact, it will be the worst performing G7 economy this year. 
So London does not have the fiscal legroom to hike wages. And yet, the workers remain adamant. It'll be interesting to see how Prime Minister Rishi Sunak navigates through this crisis. Meanwhile, the war continues to hurt people across the world. In Kenya, there's an economic crisis. People are dealing with soaring inflation and a high cost of living. The government is failing to tackle it. Now they've run out of cash. Kenya does not have money to pay the salaries of government employees. There is a major cash crisis in the country, also a public debt crisis. The government borrowed money left, right and center, so debt has soared. And so has the interest on debt. It has touched $5 billion per year, $5 billion in interest payments on domestic debt. It is five times what it was a decade ago. Here's a report. Kenya's future looks bleak. It is facing one of the worst economic crises. It's been hit hard by a cost-of-living crisis. Food prices have risen by almost 16% within a year. People are unemployed and hungry. There is growing anger. And on top of this, now there's a major cash crisis in Kenya. It means exactly what it's called. Kenya does not have enough money available. So it can't do the things it usually does, like pay salaries. Public sector employees are not being paid their dues. Civil servants, including lawmakers, did not receive pay last month. Other government workers have gone three months without theirs. The impact has been worse in rural areas. Experts say there are fears of major social upheaval. Threats of potential workers' strikes have been made. Notifications of boycotting work have been shared. If this happens, the country may come to a standstill and Kenya cannot afford this. Because delay in salary payments is not Kenya's only problem. And not just the workers, county governments are broke too. They haven't received money from the centre. So health and education spendings have taken a hit. But the government does not seem too worried, which is perplexing. Presidential economic advisor David Nadi says he has good reason. He says workers will begin receiving their salaries soon, probably by the end of the week. He blamed the cash crisis on bad timing and low revenue streams, meaning there aren't enough sources to bring money in the country. He says the situation will improve soon, which is something the government has been saying for a while now. But the crisis has been worsening. Last month, the government paid off some interest on external debts, so it was left with less cash in hand. There is also growing public debt, $72 billion of it, and a cost of living crisis. Annual inflation was 9.2% in March, well above the central bank's target. This led to weeks of protests in the country. And all this as the Kenyan shilling weakens. Its exchange rate is tanking to historic lows. This has pushed up the cost of imports. About 6 million people are suffering acute food shortage. All in all, the situation is dire. But yes, one can call it bad timing. Kenya's economy is racing towards a cliff and racing against time. 2024 could be a crunch point. There is strong and ongoing support from the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. The country has a $2 billion euro bond, but it expires next year. It needs repaying. Kenya is trying to come out of this. If redeemed successfully, pressures can ease for Kenyans. But the government is not sure when the cash crunch will be resolved. And the people are not sure if the government is doing enough to resolve it. Because the economic pain is intensifying, Kenya resembles a loaded but slow motion train wreck. Coming out of this will not be easy. And now let's look at what's happening in the other side of the world. Brazilian President Lula da Silva is visiting China. He was supposed to go in late March and it was supposed to be a mostly business trip. But Lula fell ill. He was diagnosed with pneumonia. Now that he's recovered, he's going first to Shanghai, then to Beijing. This man is 77 years old. And the fact that he's traveling this far so soon after recovery is significant. China knows it. Here's what they say. China is willing to work with Brazil to take this visit as an opportunity 
to promote the upgrading of mutually beneficial and friendly cooperation between the two countries in various fields and to inject more positive energy to promote solidarity and cooperation among developing countries and to jointly address global challenges. That's a lot to unpack, but let's break it down into two major parts. One, mutually beneficial ties between China and Brazil, and two, jointly addressing global challenges. We'll start with Brazil-China relations. Lula da Silva is visiting Shanghai for an inauguration. The latest head of the New Development Bank is taking charge. This bank, the New Development Bank, or the NDB, was formed by BRICS nations in the year 2014. It will now be headed by Dilma Rousseff. She's a former president of Brazil. She took over from Lula as president in the year 2011. And now she's heading the NDB. A key ally of Lula is heading a Shanghai-based bank. And he's attending her inauguration. This is a far cry from the rocky ties that Brasilia and Beijing shared for a while. The last president of Brazil was Jair Bolsonaro. He was a staunchly anti-China leader. He tried to limit trade with China. Lula, in his previous tenures as president, has pushed trade with China. In fact, in 2009, China had overtaken the U.S. as Brazil's top trading partner. China has been investing billions in Brazil, both in infrastructure projects and in setting up businesses. But some of that money dried up during the Bolsonaro years due to his perceived anti-China stance. Now that Lula is back in charge, China-Brazil ties are thawing. I would like to say that Brazil has returned to the stage of world diplomacy and the center of international relations, which President Lula has paid close attention to since he took office. This visit to China is undoubtedly an important step towards rebuilding the friendly relations between the two countries. Of course, we will all defend our respective interests, but by working together, we hope to seek more development for the two peoples. And now the yuan is flowing into Brazil, literally. The two countries recently agreed to trade in their local currencies. They're bypassing the US dollar. Does this mean that Lula has shifted Brazil's allegiance to China and that he's spurning the US? It's not as simple as that. Brazil is playing a delicate balancing game. As tensions continue to rise between the US and China, the US is still Brazil's second largest trading partner. Lula has to keep Washington happy. And that explains why his first state visit after becoming president was to the U.S. But these are polarized times, and a balanced approach is not appreciated in times like these. Yet Lula wants a global role for himself. So he weighed in on the war in Ukraine. This is what he said. What does Putin want? Putin can't keep Ukraine's territory. Maybe we don't even discuss Crimea but will have to rethink about what he has invaded. Also, Zelensky can't want everything he wants to demand. NATO will not be able to set itself up at the border. So this is something we have to put on the table. He suggests the middle path, and he's found no takers. Ukraine, of course, has rejected any compromise on Crimea, and Russia seems unlikely to accept a diplomatic end to the war. Which brings us to our second point, Brazil and China trying to jointly address international challenges. Xi Jinping has already proposed a peace plan. And Lula da Silva says the Chinese president is the best person to mediate in Ukraine. I am convinced both Russia and Ukraine are waiting for somebody to come and tell them to sit down and talk. Why do I want to talk to Xi Jinping? Because I think China's economic importance, China's military importance, China's political importance, and China's relationship with Russia, even China's divergence with the U.S., gives China an extraordinary power to dialogue. So Lula believes that China still has a role to play, even though their peace plan was a damp squib. And it's not just China that Lula is propping up. He has a list of potential mediators, including India. China has weight. Brazil has weight. I think Indonesia can participate. I think India can participate. Let's talk to Putin. Let's talk to Zelensky. Let's talk to Biden. Let's see if we can find a group of people that disagree with the war. 
sabe que não se conforme com a guerra. Lula's approach seems to favor a multipolar world, a world where emerging economies play a role in global diplomacy, where the world is not held hostage to the schemes of great powers. It sounds admirable, but is his choice of ally in China really the way to go about this? Because remember, as we've seen all too often, a deal with China rarely comes without strings attached. It's time for Vantage Shorts, images that tell the story. We're starting with the U.S. A major wildfire broke out in New Jersey. Only about 10% of the fire has been contained. In Colombia, a volcano is on the verge of erupting. Authorities say the volcano is unstable and there is an increased seismic activity. Parts of Syria are flooded. It is getting difficult for children to reach their schools. And now, what makes April the 12th a significant day? Let's take you back in history. On this day, the first ever human went to space. The year was 1961. Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human to orbit the Earth. The flight lasted 108 minutes. With this, the era of human space flight began and the Soviet Union beat the US to it. We're leaving you with this. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict. This year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one, the Kohinoor and the colonial loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting.